You know the procedure. If you need to confess sin, then take a moment. Just take just a minute and uh, prepare. We're right on the dot as far as time. And uh, if you're joining us on the Internet, we're glad to have you. Uh, this will be an hour class. It should go by quickly, hopefully. It won't seem like an hour. But you need to be in fellowship with the, with the Holy Spirit by confessing your, your known sins, mental, verbal, overt sins. Mental sins, what you think, what you say, and what you do, need to be confessed privately and silently. So let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your grace and mercy in Jesus Christ, for his work on the cross and the payment for sin, his work in the resurrection to defeat death, the free gift of eternal life for believing that he died to pay for the sins, our own personal sins, and that he rose from the dead to give us eternal life. If you believe in that, if you're hearing me, you'll be given eternal life must be the grace of God. You can't work or earn or deserve any of it. It's his gift. He did it all, and he gives it all to you freely, and you must accept it that way. So we come tonight, Father, to talk about marriage. I pray that you give words to express the truth, to honor you, to help us in our daily life to be greater husbands and wives, mothers and dads. We love you, Father. We praise you in Christ's name. Amen. Last night we discussed, we began a discussion of marriage, and there's so many topics of marriage. It's, marriage is probably the thickest file that I have in my, all of my notes. I've been keeping notes for close to 40 years, and I have files upon files of notes, and the thickest thing I've got is marriage, and it won't be, it can't hold it in one, so it's like three, but anyway. So we've been all to the marriage conferences and marriage studies and all that. And, uh, you know, it's, a, it's interesting. No matter how much you know about it, the challenges of marriage are still so intense and overwhelming that you have to learn the real lessons through the experience. I mean, you can't, it's, not, it's not like something you can learn beforehand and then once you get there, you go, okay, I got that one already. You have to go through it. And it's the going through it that forces you to let go of your lies, your false ideas about it, your, your, you know, Barbie fantasies and Cinderella fantasies and all that kind of stuff and, and ground yourself in reality. And so marriage is a critical part of God's plan. And we looked last night at the fact that God has a purpose for it. Let's look at three things first. He, uh, it's to meet each other's needs, our human needs. And that's why we get married. Very few of us look up and go, all right, God, I know you've got a purpose for Christian marriage, so show me who I should marry to be able to fulfill your purpose. And that's the basis on which you get married. I don't know of anybody that's done that. But most people are there to meet their needs, like it's not good for man to be alone, Genesis 2.18. So God made him a helper. In Proverbs 18.22, a man who finds a wife finds a great blessing and grace from the Lord. And isn't that the, it isn't that the truth. Secondly, God's purpose for marriage is to be a visual aid to the unbeliever so they can see that God loves and loves them and wants intimacy with them. A great Christian marriage is a visual aid of God loving his people. It's Christ in the church and the church surrendering to God. That's why it's so important to fulfill these roles. The roles, listen, the roles have nothing to do with just a, your natural inclination. There are so many women that are so smart and so strong. It's incredible. I mean, I'm married to one. And to ask her to be some submissive, you might as well forget that. And she'd break out of those bonds like boom, like Superman. She can't, that can't hold her. So it doesn't mean that, to be some submissive little person. It means to be all in behind leadership in the program, to be all in, to give all everything you've got for the purpose of completing the mission. You're connected to this guy, this leader guy, and he's blowing out and trying to fulfill God's plan, and you're right there with him, supporting, helping, doing everything you can 
Sometimes you're leading, sometimes he is. It's all a great team. It's about being a great team. That's the word. Thirdly, God uses our Christian marriage to teach fallen angels about his great genius, his character, his wisdom. He uses our marriage as a visual aid. Ephesians chapter 3, 7 through 11, we read last night. Ephesians 5, 22 through 23, when believers accept their role in marriage and practice them, everyone who watches can see the beauty of the Father's desire to be intimate with the whole human race. Listen to me for just a minute. The goal, God's goal for every human soul is to be intimate with him. The final, final end of all of this is going to end up with us in close, intimate proximity with God. It's all about your soul and his soul being joined together in intimacy. And that's what he's after here. Not only intimacy with your mate, but with one another. And there's different levels and boundaries for all that. Appropriate boundaries for all that. But sharing the love of God between us, that's the Christian life. That's the result of you living the Christian life personally. Sharing that love among John, who was the closest to the Lord, who lived the longest to learn these things through experience, he ended up saying, look, the bottom line, love one another. Bottom line is love one another. That's what it's all about. That's where, listen, that's where your influence comes from. Your influence comes when you love someone that doesn't deserve your love that maybe even deserve something different than your love. And yet you embrace them and you give to them and you keep giving to them and they don't have to earn it. They don't have to pay anything back. And they're like, what is this? That's the that's, That's the witness. That's the witness that comes out of you when you give to others. So that's the, that's what God's using Christian marriage for in the world at large. Secondly, your marriage plays an important role in his purpose for reaching the lost. And and listen, encouraging fellow believers in the church. We're a visual aid of Christ and the church. Now, if you will, turn to Ephesians 5 with me for just a minute. I want to show you something that's really, really important that that you really don't see unless you're a student of the Greek. And I'm not going to pull out the Greek or do anything like that. I've... We've got somebody that does a much better job of that than me. But I am fairly proficient with this. In chapter 5, verse 22, Paul begins to discuss marriage. He's in a phase in his book here where he's getting into the very practical aspects of the Christian life. And he's talking marriage between verse 22 and 33. And he starts off with wives. And listen, every... Biblical writer starts off with wives. And I'm going to talk about that. Why does he always start with a wife? But he talks about the wife being all in, committed, surrendered to the Lord, to serve uh, along with her mate to pursue the objective of creating the image of Christ in the church. That's the objective. And he talks about the wife, then he talks about the husband. And you think that what he's doing is giving you marriage advice. You think that he's stopped and doing a very practical thing about marriage. And it is very practical. It's really, really interesting. Uh, Like in verse 28 through 30, he talks about the husbands. You think of the woman being the nurturing one in the relationship, but it's really the husband. It's the husband who nurtures the wife. It's the husband. Now, he goes, and he's in this discussion, for, and, and he gets into verse 30 because we're members of his body, and then he says, for this cause a man shall leave his father and mother 
and shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery. And listen to what he says. But I'm actually speaking about Christ and the church. You see, this whole discussion has been about Christ and the church. Forming the image of Christ in the church. That's what the roles are for. The roles in marriage, submission and love, have nothing to do with ability, natural inclination, who's greater than the other, who's better than the other. It has nothing to do with it. It has to do with forming the image of Christ in the church. You follow that? That's what the marriage is to do. Now, ask yourself, is your marriage, is that your marriage? Is that your marriage? I mean, here's the problem. See, a lot of people get along better if the wife leads. Because if a man doesn't lead, and a lot of men in our society now have been uh, feminized, that's the goal of the liberal press and the liberal media and all that. They want to feminize the man so that he doesn't, he's not a threat to the woman. And so men don't know how to lead anymore. They don't have the courage to lead. You know, they've been neutered. And so, because of that, women end up taking control. They end up, and I'll tell you another thing. If a woman doesn't choose to, to uh, honor her role as a submissive party, the, the one who, wor- who cooperates with the leadership, there is no way that the man can make that happen. It's got to be a gift that the woman gives the Lord. You have to give that to the Lord for his purposes. This is not about your personal marriage, your personal relationship. This is about you obeying and surrendering to the Lord's mission for Christian marriage, which is to form an image of Christ in the church for the angels to be convicted of their sin and their stupidity. That's what it's about. Now, question being, do you love the Lord more than you love your own personal inclinations and your own personal feelings and all that about your marriage to be able to do what God has asked? See, it's not about the man. It's not about the husband. It's about you and God. Same with the love. Same with the love. When the man is at the end of his rope and he's about to hang himself with it, The only way he comes back and honors the Lord is by surrendering to him because the Lord says, go back back in and make it right. Shut up. Quit complaining. Quit whining. Be a man. Go in and make it right. How did he do that, Father? He said, the first thing it involved is saying, I'm so sorry. Yes? Yes? So, visual aid of Christ in the church, adopting these roles, adopting these roles is a voluntary and very personal gift to the Lord. In your marriage, you taking the role of either the loving leader or the cooperative helper is a personal gift from you to the Lord. You don't have to do it. I don't, you know, I mean, listen, it's pretty obvious when you see it. It's pretty obvious when you see that. I don't know that you you see it very often. I don't know that you do. I mean, I'll let you live with that, but, I mean, that's your personal business. Conflict, thirdly, is inevitable in marriage. It's inevitable. And listen... It's a good thing. Everybody's afraid of it. People are so terrified of conflict, they will do anything to avoid it. This often happens in marriage is that one person is stronger than the other personality-wise, and they push and push and push for their, to get their way, and the other finally just goes, whatever, whatever. So they avoid the conflict. They don't ever really deal with the issue involved. The conflict is good because it's what enables you to, it shows you that there are differences 
that need to be resolved often through compromise. Often through compromise. Not by authority. You don't resolve conflicts in marriage with authority. If you do, you're an idiot. Because all you'll do is try to beat your wife down and get her to do what you want her to do and all you're going to do is to get her to do the very opposite. Gentlemen, you are a shepherd. You're a shepherd. You shepherd your wife into teamwork. You shepherd her into following the Lord. You shepherd her into this. You lead her with, it, with your example and by giving her freedom. She is free to do as she wants to do as under the Lord. She's free. She doesn't owe you a thing. She made a vow, but that was a long time ago. You probably can't remember what you said. Anybody remember what you said? I don't. I know basically what I said. Sorry, darling. <laughs> Look, I ain't done it very well anyway. You know, it's not a, I'm not walking in the Spirit. I'm stumbling in the Spirit. Just trying to get there. Now, so it's inevitable. It's good. It shows you where you need to work on stuff. And listen, if you're, if you're not afraid of being exposed... Do you know that everybody is messed up? Did you not know that? Ladies, all of you are messed up. You're a mess, a hot mess. How you like that? Now, I want to talk about one of the great issues in marriage is breaking when the, when the subconscious programming that's been put into our hearts through our earlier life, especially through our parental training and our parental environment. That's what programs you. I don't care who you are and you say whatever you say. When you have your own kids, you're going to find yourself wanting to discipline them the same way you were disciplined. It's just going to come out of the blue and you're going to go, what was that? That was my mother. <laughs> my mother would wait till she got smoking mad before she spanked us. And then when she spanked us, it was like, wow. It was wow. You know, blood going everywhere and stuff. I mean, I'm talking really. Today she had put her in jail. But anyway, and I didn't, I didn't do that to my kids, but I sure wanted to at times. Uh, but here's the, here's the point. Now let's talk about, let's see, listen. Everybody thinks the subconscious is this mysterious part of the soul, this mysterious, it's not mysterious at all. I'm going to tell you just simply how it works. As we grow up, we have so much to learn. And we're in a learning curve like no other time in our life. From the time that we're zero until we're like five and then ten, and then, then we're in this huge learning phase and here's what happens we have an issue in our life and we have an experience and we ask ourselves what was that why did it happen what does it mean if it was a good experience you'd like to repeat it how do I get it to happen again if it was a bad one you want to know how to keep it from repeating I don't ever want that to happen again so point being you come up with an idea either from someone else, from the world, from your own create, creative ability, and you decide this is what happened, and this is what it means. And that idea pops in your brain, and when you believe it, when you believe it's true, you know, you know this old diagram? Remember this? Here's the mind, here's the heart. Starts in the mind over here. You reach a conclusion about your human experience. And whatever conclusion you reach over here, if you decide to believe it, can y'all see that? Sort of, maybe. I know it. If you decide to believe it, 
it becomes part of your heart and part of your conscience. Your belief system, it's a, it's a belief that you now hold of your own. You follow that? Now, once you take that belief in and you use it in your life a number of times, you habituate it. You turn it, it becomes a habit. And it turns into automatic thinking. You just automatically do it. Now, the way this thing really works is more like an onion than a box, but it's layer upon layer upon layer. Do you remember Isaiah 28, where Isaiah's teaching the people and it's line upon line, precept upon precept? That's how the belief system works, is that one belief, see, whatever you believe today, let's say this is your belief system with all these ideas in it, and you're having a human experience that you've never had before. You're going you're gonna to go draw on these beliefs that you already hold to evaluate what's going on out here. You're going to look at it based on what's already in your soul. And you're going to evaluate your experience based on that. And whatever ideas that pop up over here or somebody shares with you, if it doesn't fit, you're going to say no. But if you can make it fit as an explanation for this experience, you might believe it and it's going to come over here and be assimilated. Everything's going to shift and work itself together so that all this fits. You follow that? Then you're going to use that idea in life, they say about 21 times by the time you use it for a short period in your life, you forget about it and you automatically do it. That's why in certain circumstances, you push a button and boom, there's behavior. Boom. You decide, somebody says, don't let anybody push you around. Don't let anybody push you around. You get somebody like me, if you get in my face, I kind of go crazy. But, you know, if you're a woman and you, and you hear that and you're like, Ain't no man going to push me around. You get married. Look, if you, if you really feel that way, don't get married. Okay? Now, it's not, I'm not suggesting that husbands should push wives around. Not at all. I'm just saying. He's going to have an opinion. And it's your job to confront that and discuss that and interact with that and finally be supportive. Okay, so if you've got a belief in here that says nobody's going to tell me what to do, well, then your marriage is going to be a fight if you married a man. And look, what's going to happen over time is if he really isn't strong and doesn't have firm convictions of his own, just to keep peace, he's finally going to just go, forget it, forget it. You, you run the show. You, you do what you want. I'm not going to fight you over it. Look, here's the money. Go buy whatever you want. I'm not going to, I mean, I'm tired of fighting. I'm not going to fight you anymore because submission must be a gift the woman gives to the Lord. It's a gift. It's a precious, precious gift to make your soul vulnerable to the Lord in that way to where you are the support system for a man. So, tremendous. Conflict is necessary to work all that out. And once you get ideas in your soul, your heart, they, they pop up automatically. Now, here's the point. We're born spiritually dead with nothing in our soul, we grow up in the devil's world with a sin nature, and we're building these ideas day after day after day in our life. And until we get saved, none of those ideas can come from God. Do you understand that? It can't come from God because you don't have a relationship with him. 
And 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, even if you heard the word of God, you couldn't understand it. Adunatos means you're not able because it requires the ministry of the Spirit to understand spirit. So here's the point. All of these ideas that you build before, and listen, literally, before you become spiritual, until you start listening to God to form your ideas and quit listening to other people and your friends and the world, the water cooler or whatever. You know, we hear all this crap. You know, we listen to the public radio and there's a lot of good principles, but we think life's about politics. It's not. Who cares? You know, it's going that way anyway. God's letting it roll anyway. But anyway, here's the point. When you get saved, you get a whole new system over here called the new man. This is the old man. But you bring all of this into the Christian life with you. Turn to Romans chapter 6. I want to show you something. I want to try to possibly correct some misunderstanding that we have about what happens at salvation, about this passage. In Romans chapter 6, this is a significant passage. Paul's going to talk about being enslaved to sin. He says, whatever you surrender yourself to becomes your master. You become a slave to it. And listen, what he's talking about is the fact that, that everything that we take in and utilize becomes habitual. It turns into automatic thinking. We lose consciousness of it, and now it's controlling us. Here's the point. Whatever you put in here, whatever you believe and put in there, because you, you don't put anything in there unless you believe it, controls how you think, feel, and behave. It controls it. You follow that? It controls you. That's why it's real important, not do you believe, it's what you believe. Now, Romans 6, starting with at verse 6. Let me build up to it a little bit. He's talking about being baptized into Christ and buried with him through baptism into his death, that just as he was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we might also walk in newness of life. For if we become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection. And he says, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, so that our body of sin might be done away with, and we should no longer be slaves to sin. Now, people read that and they go, look, that old man is dead. Why are you even talking about it? That old man's dead, right? Isn't that what he says? Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him? Well, let me show you something. It was crucified with him. At the point of your salvation, your old self was crucified positionally with Christ. Practically, that freed you from your slavery to the sin nature. Before you were saved, you had no recourse but to follow your own nature. Are you with me? You're an unbeliever. You have an old man belief system that's all about me, 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 me. And that's what you follow. But the day you get saved, you get a new man, a new nature, a Christ nature, the Holy Spirit. You begin to learn the Word of God. There's a whole new thing in town. I mean, there's a whole new sheriff in town. But... You still got this old way. But watch what he says, that it was crucified positionally the moment you were saved so that, listen, he says, Hina, anybody know what Hina means? It means purpose. So that, in order that. The body of sin, which is this old man system he's talking about, might be done away with. And that word might be done away with is the word kat argeo. And it's an, listen, it's an aorist passive subjunctive. 
Now, I know that doesn't mean a lot to you, but listen. The subjunctive mood is the mood of possibility. It's not the mood of something that's already been accomplished. It's the mood of something that can be accomplished if you choose for it to be accomplished. You follow me? At the moment of salvation, we were positionally freed from the old system to go, we are now free, Galatians 5.1, we're free to live free. This whole thing's still there, and the point of being free is so that we might do away with it, the residual results of living that long with it, the thinking that goes along with it, because the thinking's still there, and it still interferes in our life. Here's how you know, after all the years of doctrine, you would think we should have perfected this new man system. We should be consistently doing it. We should just be have perfected it. We should always be in the new man. We shouldn't get out of fellowship anymore. But look, this old one over here keeps drawing us back. Drawing, see, the moment you let go of the Spirit, you're walking in the Spirit, stumbling in the Spirit, crawling in the Spirit, you know, being drugged by the Spirit. And the moment you let go of the Spirit to go and do your human thing, boom, you're right back in there. And your old thoughts and your old ideas and your old wants and your old strategies, boom, they come alive. This happens in marriage all the time. This old program, and, it's, and marriage is the most intense environment for which this is exposed. Nothing will expose you in your old way of thinking more than your marriage. Because it's the most dear to your heart. It's the most intimate relationship in your life. It's the one in which you have to, to fulfill your role and be a team player. And you discover that you still have so much selfishness and me-centered thinking, it's just so difficult. And, and listen, it's only through spiritual growth and the letting go of these things. Paul says you got to lay that stuff aside. you got to take it off. I call it erase it and replace it. I ought to write a book like that. Now, the old man was crucified, breaking the dominance of old man beliefs at the point of salvation. Once that was done, we now are free to do away with the thinking, the residual thinking we brought in with us. It's possible. It wasn't possible before. He's going to go on in chapter 6 to explain why it's necessary. Because once you give in to something, listen, you put something in your heart and you use it in your life, you give yourself to it, it becomes your master because it becomes habituated and you can't make it stop. It just comes out automatically. Am I right? The stuff that comes up automatically in your life, once you get enough pressure put on you, listen, the pressure, boy, you refer back to the default. Your default is me. Don't tell me what to do. You know, you're not servicing me. I mean, what about me in this thing? I mean, I see, I see you want your, what your way, but what about me? And that's how we feel. Because, look, that's the old system. The old system is me. <laughs> I built it myself. Out of my own creative thinking and my own genius, I built this thing myself to try to get by in the devil's world. That's what it was for trying to find my way through the devil's world and eke out a little bit of happiness and keep from being destroyed. So, when R.B. Thing was coming to the end of his ministry, a really, really terrible thing happened. His dear friend, his dear secretary, Katie, her son committed suicide. Remember that, Gary? And it was after that that the question was asked. He'd been, he'd been under doctrine for years and years and years, and the question was, how, how could he do that? And what he came up with is that he had, he called it garbage in the subconscious. And he began to teach that in order for you to, 
be able to apply and use the doctrine you had, you had to clean out the garbage in the subconscious. And that was one of the first things that clued me into all this. When he began to teach, I'm like, garbage in the, how do you get garbage in the subconscious? And more importantly, how do you get it out? How do you get it out of the subconscious? That's a whole other story. But that's what he taught. Now let's talk about, we've, we've discussed briefly conflict resolution. Let's talk about conflict escalation. That's even more fun. All right, I got this. I got these four categories from Mr. Dr. John Gottman. Dr. Gottman, Gottman is not a believer, but he is a marriage specialist. He has got more information. What he does in his clinic is he takes a married couple, and he's done tens of thousands of these, and he wires them up, wires their brains and everything, and they, and they got cameras there, and they observe them. And he's found these clues, and one of his clues is if, if you say something, if one of the partners say something and the other one rolls our eyes, he said, they're on the way out. Because if it's gotten to that point where they're eye rolling and there's contempt, ridicule, not good. Not a good thing. That means there's a lot of built up bitterness, a lot of mm, eye rolling disrespect city so these four things i'm going to share with you that's these are his his this is his outline and i liked it i thought it was pretty good so here's four ways he calls them the four horsemen you know like the four horsemen in the bible and he, here's a link if you want to go look at his stuff i read his book years ago and he's literally got so much detailed information about what people think in marriage that he knows he can spot it within about 10 minutes of who's going to get divorced and who's not. He's a good, you know, you, you want to bet on him. All right, first is defensiveness. Oh, I don't remember. Just look up Dr. Gottman. You'll, you'll, uh, you'll, he's probably got several books. But anyway, defensiveness is when you view the, any and all conflicts as an attack. And you think it's intended to demean and, do, and to dominate you. You can't hear anything about yourself without thinking, I'm, be, I'm being attacked. So you're defensive about everything. Your partner is not able to point anything out about what you're doing or not doing. Can't do it because you're going to go into defense mode. And this is a victim mentality. You feel like a victim. You know, you, it's you against the world, and you live in your little stronghold, your defensive place where nobody can hurt you, especially that bad guy that you married or that bad woman that you married. You, they can't hurt you because you've got your walls, and you're in defense mode. That's what a stronghold is. It's a defensive structure to keep you safe, and it's something we build. Of, see, it's something that's associated with the old man. It's not a new man's uh, structure at all, and Paul said they're to be torn down. They're to be torn down. He said our devices, our systems, our spiritual methods are to tear those things down. So, one of the things that happens uh, in in marriage is trans, called transference, and that's where both men and women take all the experiences they've had with the member of the opposite sex, starting with father or mother boyfriends, brothers, all the way through to that point, you take all of those experiences and you add them all up and you transfer that to your partner. They are now responsible for all of the hurt or the, the good or the bad that you've experienced. It's transference. Look. You say, I do, and walk down the aisle, and the next thing you know, you've transferred all that to each other. So, he's gone through parental divorce, where his mother cheated and broke his father's heart and all that kind of stuff, so he's got all that hurt and pain in him, and he went through a, a thing when he was in high school where a girl cheated on him, and the next thing you know, he is suspicious of all women cheat being cheaters. 
Why? He's added all the experience up, and now he's, he's transferring it to you. That works. He said, that's not very fair. No, but it is what it is. Thirdly, defensiveness causes you to avoid responsibility for your part of the conflicts. You refuse to come out of your, your fantasy that, there, that you're not to blame to face the reality of your own flaws. Listen, there's no way to make progress together unless everybody's in, in a reality phase. It, it can Looking at things in a reality, we're all messed up. And we're all trying to get unmessed up and more and more like Christ. And the only way to do that is to see where you're going bad. I mean, the way you're doing it is not good. But if you can't be, if you can't hear that, because everything that's said to you is an attack, there's no progress. Because there's, if there's an attack and you're going to attack back. It, not a really good marital strategy, okay? Not at all. So, but this is like phase one. You make excuses for your behavior that, rather than resolving your behavior. Look, all you got to do is go to the Lord. He'll show you why you're doing that. What you see, defensiveness comes from fear. It's fear of being hurt. Fear of being cheated on. Fear of, fear of something. Being left, being alone, and not having enough. Or something. It's a fear. So you live ready. You live in hypertension. I mean, you're tense all the time. You're ready. If anybody says a word, woo, you're ready to go. Secondly, criticism. This is disappointment expressed. You're trying to change your partner by complaining about their behaviors because you're disappointed in what you ended up with. You're disappointed. Look, you married that person. You didn't really know them because you can't know somebody till you live with them for about 10 years. And after that, you go, geez, I'd like to trade you in. Can I go back and start over? Disappointment. Objectively discussing specific behaviors, again, turns into an attack on the person. See, instead of dealing with behaviors... Your little disappointed heart starts to attack the person. And that hurts. Here's something that happens in your general when you're criticizing, generalizing. You, you, you say, you always, or you never. Yeah. Now, I call that girl talk, but that's not really fair. But when you say, you always... I'm like, I always? Yeah, you always. I'm like, never mind. <laughs> I, better, I better be quiet. <clears throat> I better, I'm, I'm be quiet, darling. Uh, yeah. You, you, listen, you use your immediate feelings as your gauge for what's going on. In the, the, in the moment, you're upset or you feel attacked or you feel defensive, and now you're going to base your discussion on that rather than reality and rather than truth. And what you need to do is take a deep breath and get back in, the fe in fellowship, walk away a minute, and come back and talk. Discuss things semi-objectively. Now, when you're in criticism, you, you always have to be right. Do you know anybody that always has to be right? Yeah, that just can't be wrong. If they're wrong, then they're a fool. They're afraid to be wrong and be seen as wrong. They can't do it. It's very difficult to deal with problems and resolve them when you can't be wrong. That means that you can't be sinful. That means you can't be flawed. You can't be participating or contributing to the problem here. It has to all be the other person. Judging. This is where we get into judging. Mind reading of motives. Making assumptions based on past behaviors. Listen, just because something happened 10 years ago and somebody said something, it doesn't mean they're still there doing the same thing. And you can't read people's minds, and you're not the judge of their motives. 
Thirdly is contempt. This is where you get into, this is the next phase. Now you're into contempt. This is not good. You attempt to demean your partner through ridicule and mocking. And you find yourself starting to mock people. Hey, you know, in your, you're, you're in a fight and you start mocking the way somebody's talking. Ooh. Mocking people hurts. Especially when you mean it. I mean, it's like, it's not a joke. You avoid looking at your own old man behaviors and beliefs, and you ridicule your you ridicule your partner to avoid exposure. Listen, that old man, he don't want to be exposed. We don't like to be exposed. We don't like our flaws to be revealed. We like to keep all that stuff hidden behind the mask. But in marriage, listen, the mask comes off. There is no intimate marriage behind the mask. You can't be married and have intimacy and be successful in the Lord behind a mask. You got to take it off. You got to let yourself be known. You go, oh, no, I can't do that. I mean, you, don't, you can't let yourself be vulnerable. And therefore, you can't be intimate. You live behind a wall that nobody can get to, even God. Even God. God won't break through that wall. He's going to wait for you to come out. And if I were you and you found yourself behind a wall, here's what I would do. I would make a door in that wall, and I'd open the door. Or I'd make a window, and I'd open the window. And the next thing you know, Jesus would poke his head in and go, Hey, what's happening? I'm coming in. Next thing you know, you can come out of there and be alive instead of be hiding somewhere inside your soul. All this stuff shut down so you don't feel hurt. That's old man stuff. See, that's the way human, the, the devil's world beats the you-know-what out of a soul. Without God's protection, a, a, a human soul hadn't got a prayer in the devil's world. We have to go into all this defensive stuff just to survive. You can't get through elementary school without being mocked and ridiculed and made fun of. and all. It's a, it's a dog-eat-dog dog world, elementary school. I mean, no wonder kids are carrying guns. You're into a war of words. You've lost hope that your marriage can be based in reality because you don't think that other person's ever going to really come out and be real. They're stuck in their stronghold and they won't come out. So, because of that, you never get to forgiveness or agreement or growth. There's a war of words expressing anger and bitterness toward one another instead of giving it to God. Insults intended to transfer your own pain to them pointing out their weaknesses to embarrass them, but not ever looking at your own. D listen, this is real stuff. This is real stuff. And I'm saying all this, I'm pointing all this out, so hopefully you can see yourself. If you're in this, if you're following this pattern, if this is you, in any shape, form, you got to turn and look at that. And give that to the Lord. He will help you get rid of it. Finally, stonewalling. This is what we call detente. You give up. You decide to seek your own space and freedom from your mate. You just build a wall. You live inside your little wall and you find your own life in there. You build your own life apart from your mate. You still go home. You still eat supper. You still sleep in the bed. But there's no relationship. There's no intimacy and there's not going to be. Because you have given it up. And there's nothing that can be said or done that's going to break through your wall. You increasingly numb your emotions. <coughs> Finally detaching altogether from your mate. You don't really care anymore. You don't let yourself care. You know, it, it's too risky. It hurts too much to, to let yourself care about that. They're going to hurt you. So forget you. Listen, life hurts. 
You can't go through life without getting hurt. And just because you get hurt, it's not the other person's fault all the time. And even if it is, who cares? The answer is forgiveness, not defensiveness. The sin of self-protection where you build a wall between you and that person, that is not God's answer. It's a survival, this is a survival strategy. You've decided that this is so bad and so disappointing and so unhappy that you just, you're just going to have to hunker down and try to get through it and pray that death comes early, you know, for at least for your, at least for your partner. <laughs> and you start looking at different ways to poison them and things like that. But you rebuild your interest and efforts to form a life apart from your mate. You seek legitimate activities like Christian ministry that take you out of the home and giving you legit, legit excuses for not relating. Hey, I, 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 I've got to work. You know, I got to work. You know, I got a ministry. I got this going. I got that going. I can't hang around and make things work with you. I'm done with that. Of course, you don't ever say that. You find your way. You find your excuses. Your disappointment turns into resentment and bitterness. You become numb. You just numb your emotions so that you don't have to feel anything. And you cease to care. And even then you can turn into, you can go into hatred from there if you want, but you may not have to. You may just have to just be numb. Just be numb. Rather than continue the fight, we withdraw into our stronghold and live without feeling. Most people don't feel much at all. They have a very narrow range of emotional intensity. They're just right here on the both sides. They don't feel much bad. They don't feel much good. No matter what it is. They, you know why? Because it's the most natural human defense mechanism there is, is, is going numb. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 21, it says, Fathers, don't abuse your children lest they become disheartened. And the word disheartened is athumos. Thumos means passion. These people have no passion. These are people that just go through the motions of life but never really enjoy it, never really get crazy, never really experience they just go through the motions and stay in their little safe zone, numbed out. So, another passage, Ephesians 4.19, people in reversion of it, so they get into, to they get in, they see, it's called, see, they cease to care. They stop caring. Because they can't make it work the way they want to make it work. They cease to care. Now, finally, let's talk about what you do. How do you get out of this? Because those are problems that hopefully are not in your life, but probably some of them are to some degree. These are normal, natural human strategies that people use in marriage or in any relationship apart from the Lord. But you say, look, I want to live my life for the Lord. Well, all right. Well, how about... Let's confess our sin. Let's confess our sin. How about confessing the fact that you hadn't done any of this right? How about confessing the fact that you're not, you're not handling yourself well? You establish fellowship with the Spirit and, and begin to ask God to help you both. You renew your relationship with God. That'd be your first thing. That'd be your main thing because, see, listen, when you live in a marriage like we're describing, it's very, very difficult to be spiritual. You can, again, you can come to church and listen and go through the motions, fulfill even your ministry, but your heart is not, is not well. Peter says to men, live with your wife in an understanding way, giving honor to her, lest your prayers be hindered. When there's no domestic, listen, when mama's not happy, you know the rest of that? Nobody's happy. Not even the Lord. 
The secondly, how about accepting responsibility for your part of it? It's just a fact of Scripture that you and I built an old way of thinking out of our sinfulness, out of our me-centered life, apart from God that's still in us, that comes up and bites us in many different ways that God wants us to be aware of. And when we see it and it's active in our life, to rip it out and throw it away. That's not, uh, that's not a request. Accept your responsibility for your part of it. Wake up. Take the blinders off. I used to think just because I had so much knowledge that somehow that made me better. Listen, knowledge makes you proud. Makes you stupid. The more you know, the stupider you get. You can't, listen, because you got knowledge don't mean you can live any of it. You got to recognize your own choices to use old man ideas. When you see yourself operating in ways that aren't with according to, that, that, you say Christ would never act that way. I'm acting in a way that he would not be selfish, he would not be angry, he would not be bitter, he would not be using all these mechanisms trying to maneuver the other person. He wouldn't be doing all that. That shows you, what am I doing? And even more important, why am I doing it? What do I do about it? Thirdly, recognize the freedom and respect your partner's freedom to make choices under the Lord. Quit trying to maneuver them and manipulate them and get them to become what you want them to be. Give them freedom to be who they are. They belong to God. They don't belong to you. Nobody has got to be free. And you're over here with your disappointment and you're feeling like a victim and somehow you got cheated and you got gypped in this deal. That's how people, I got gypped. Recognize your own freedom to grow and your, other, your partner's freedom to grow and give them freedom. Let them be. And that's more difficult than it, than it sounds. Fourthly, study and pray together. Start to do things together. Find some area of agreement. <laughs> I remember listening to Herman years ago, and he was talking about something along these lines, and he said, look, if you can just get the prayer list from church and take the first name, and both of you pray for the person. He said, there's, there's some agreement. You know, it's a start. It's a place to start where you agree on something. I thought, well, that's pretty smart. Observe your old man beliefs. Monitor your inner dialogue and what images you're making in your life. You're thinking. Listen, let me share this with you. We're going to run out of time. But thinking. Here's the heart. Here's your ideas, your beliefs, belief system. This is, we'll call it, the, there's the old man, same one over here is the new man. Listen, you don't get another heart. Both systems fit in the heart. But anyway, your beliefs produce your thoughts. Is it Jesus? Could be, could be Jesus. Uh, now, your thoughts are formed. This is so important. This is down in the knit and grit. This is the most important thing I've said all night. Two ways. Turn in your Bibles real quick to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18. Visual. Ephesians 1, 18. Anybody know that passage? I pray that what? The eyes of your heart. What are the eyes of your heart? It's your ability to visualize. He goes on to say, I pray the eyes of your heart may be given light 
so that you may know, and the word know is a verb to see, so that you may see the hope of his calling, the riches of his glory, and the surpassing greatness of his power. Those are the three things that Paul wants us to visualize. You follow me? With the eyes of her heart. I mean, what a phrase. The eyes of your heart. It's your ability to see with your mind. That's thinking. And the second one is verbal. The Old Testament phrase, he said in his heart. You know, Sarah laughed in her heart. We say all kinds of stuff in our heart. Thinking occurs at least in those ways. It's more, there's more than that. But we visualize and we verbalize. And here you are dealing in your marriage. And the next thing you know, you're feeling this pressure to be angry, to be jealous, to be upset, to want to, to lash out, to want to complain. And if you will be observant, if you will watch yourself, Paul tells you to, to look closely at yourself. If you will do that, you'll see an image in your mind of your partner doing something wrong. And you'll be telling yourself, uh-uh-uh, you're not doing me right. You'll hear it and you'll see it and you'll go. And that's what will create the feeling. So when you see, based on a lie from the old man, when you see this image of you manipulating your partner and telling yourself, if I act angry or if I act mad, she's probably going to understand how important that is to me and maybe she'll change. Oh, and, and the demons are going, sure, buddy. That's the one to go with. I'd, I'd pick that one. Yeah, I'd pick that one. Of all the ones that you've got, all these promises of God over here, I'd pick this one that if you act up, you know, act out, that's going to definitely change his or her heart. Yeah, that's an old man lie. You just told yourself. You saw it in your soul. You saw it working. Look, you know what you do? When you catch yourself making that image, you erase it. Erase it in your soul and replace it with an image of you being like Jesus Christ. And listen, if you'll do that a hundred times before you go to bed, it'll make a lasting change in your soul. So, that's just my method. Finally, start to initiate affirmations. I will say this. They did a Harvard study of successful business teams. The Harvard Business School, pretty good school. The successful business teams had six times more positive comments than negative. My point is, for every negative comment you make, you got to make at least four or five positive comments to break even. One negative. They said the negative was important because the negative confronted the people with their weaknesses. And they were able to grow out of them. It wasn't like all positive because that's la-la land. You needed some negative. You needed some reality. But when you had someone who looked at reality and responded to it in a positive, positive image. They, they created a positive image for the others to follow. They had more success than all the rest. Finally, trust the Lord. L let your partner go. Just, l just let them go and trust the Lord. Yes, sorry. <laughs> John, all right. Let's close. Father, pray that this is helpful. I pray it can be heard. I pray it can be heard through all of the static that comes with being, having grown up here, a prophet in his home, hometown, all of that stuff, being younger than some, not being the main man, lots of different issues that interfere with our ability to hear. I pray that you cut through all those things and enable us to hear these words and these concepts and take them to heart and be able to look at ourselves 
honestly, seeking reality, not our fantasy, not our, our fantasy of us being perfect and, and us being enough. I've grown enough. I've, I'm good enough in my marriage. I'm not going anymore. I've done it. I've been in it so long. I don't want to go anymore. And it's just the most important ministry in our life, Father. And we can't afford to give up on it. It's, it's going to be the core basis of our nation and our ministry outward. So I pray for all that, Father, and I pray for, for uh, Ron and Jane and the family and all them, the safe trips home, and I thank you that Gary's leg is healing and all the people we prayed for last night. Uh, I, I love you, Father. I'm just totally, totally in love with you. Just crazy about you. You're just so good to us. And I pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.